The African American legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, and religion. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they had been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is Christopher Paul Moore, author of Black Soldiers, the Unsung Heroes of World War II. Uh, Christopher is the research coordinator at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Glad to have you with us today. Chris. Thank you for having me, Doctor. Now, what inspired you to write this book? Well, it was an interest that started with my parents. They were both, uh, they had both served in World War II. My mm -hmm. mother was a WAC. My dad was a sergeant, quartermasters. I'd heard stories about the war. And actually, my father passed away in, uh, in, in the year 2000, and that kind of gave me the That gave you the motivation. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I did his eulogy, and people said, gee, this should be a movie. Mm -hmm. So that was the start of it. And I came upon a, uh, a really a treasure trove of letters at the Schomburg Center and started to put the two together, the story of my parents and also black soldiers throughout the war. Well, how did you get these letters? Did you do personal I, contact? Did you write? Did you call the Defense Department or what? Eventually, I did all of those things, but I was very, I'm a very, I'm a, I'm a lucky researcher is what I am first, Dr. Brown. You're a good researcher. Well, but it's all, <laughs> luck helps. And at, at the Schomburg Center, there's a wonderful uh, archivist, uh, Diana Lachatiner, and on the first stop, really, to see if I could find any correspondence from World War II, Diana mentioned, oh, well, you know, there was a director of the Schomburg named Lawrence Reddick during mm -hmm. World War II, and he has a collection which had never really been uh, uh, published or even seen. So I took a look at those. Long story short, to make the letters work, it's interesting when you read individual letters, uh, but I was seeing letters from places like New Guinea, Australia, Alaska, mm -hmm. India, and it didn't make sense. I didn't know a lot about black soldiers stationed there. So it really led me to basically recreate the war so that the letters made sense. They also helped you understand what the black soldiers were doing during the war. Well, what I found very fascinating about your book is your description of your family history. You have a very unique family history. Many black folks have yes. a unique family. Tell us about your well, family history. I'm very lucky in that, well, my mom's uh, family goes back to the, she always says, don't forget the Indians, the Native Americans in New York, the people who allegedly sold mm -hmm. the island called the Lenape. And they intermarried with the first Africans who were brought here as slaves in the 16, about 1625. They also intermarried with some of the Dutch. So my mom has a Dutch last name, as do many of my relatives. Um, I had the benefit of her giving me a lot of, of information about the Native American history and also European history. She didn't know a great deal about African history. Mm -hmm. That actually was encouraged by my father, who was from Alabama, and he was a little more settled mm -hmm. in being an African American, that his, his grandfather was a slave. My great-grandfather, which still to me is kind of amazing in 2005 that I'm only separated by two generations from someone who was enslaved. Uh, they were in Tuskegee, Alabama. Uh, my great-grandfather, uh, during the Civil War, when the Union uh, troops got to Alabama, actually fed the horses and the cattle for the Union troops. I, when Booker T. Washington came to uh, Tuskegee, uh, my, my great-grandfather was doing well enough. He'd had a couple of grain mills and things, and he actually gave Booker T. one of his first carriages. He, he, he loaned it to him, but he never got it back. And my dad, as well, was a barber uh, at Tuskegee, Tuskegee Institute in the 30s, and he used to cut uh, uh, Dr. George Washington Carver's hair. So that was sort of my Black History Month, because my dad would tell me that Dr. Carver really just wanted you to pat his, pat his head. Mm -hmm. But he gave me, since I was raised upstate New York, I'm sort of digressing here, but my father always gave me that sense of what our family did as African Americans in this country, and it just, I, I was just lucky to hear of my heritage from both of my, my parents. I think it's very important because a lot of African Americans don't know their heritage. Absolutely. Uh, for one thing, we were never encouraged to look into mm -hmm. it, and then when we do get encouraged, the records are gone or we don't know where to get them. Mm -hmm. I was interested in that you mentioned Tuskegee. You know, On the cover uh, <laughs> of your book, You're one of the princes you have of Tuskegee. the Tuskegee Airmen. <laughs> the, the most sung of the heroes. Of the most sung of the, un, of the unsung <laughs> heroes. Okay, heroes. And I was a Tuskegee Airman, yes, as sir. the audience knows. I know Tuskegee 
and I am just so proud to be affiliated in some way with the great Tuskegee tradition, Tuskegee Institute, Tuskegee, Alabama, the uh, John Andrew Memorial mm -hmm. Hospital, uh, uh, make uh, the field, a Moton field Moten after field. Robert uh -huh. Moton, the former president. It's a tremendous yes. terms of story. So you even the story of Dr. Booker T. Washington, by the way, which. You know, through the through the later periods, we we uh, those of us in the North tend to be of the Du Bois faction mm -hmm. and tended to belittle uh, Washington. But I think there was a real strong work ethic that I know went through my dad and mm -hmm. into uh, I think into into me a little bit too. Well, in the ni early 1900s, Booker T. Washington was the most powerful black man in America. Absolutely. And his theory was that by getting vocational education, you'd be able to infiltrate the trades and get some economic stability, and then work for social progress mm -hmm. and social equality. Du Bois, of course, as you say, being from the North with a liberal arts, mm -hmm. a Harvard education, wanted us to get this education and, and advocate our rights and then possibly work into mm -hmm. the economic. Well, it turns out that those, they merge. They blend. There's really no real dichotomy mm -hmm. between uh, Washington and Du Bois because we need economic power and clearly we need political mm -hmm. power. And in some instances, the economic power makes it possible for us to get the political power. Mm -hmm. Like it was the black businessmen in the South who supported Martin Luther King in the Civil Absolutely. Rights Movement. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people overlooked that. Mm -hmm. They think it was mm -hmm. something about white mm -hmm. northerners mm -hmm. and some black mm -hmm. northerners coming down. No, this was an indigenous movement mm -hmm. of those people who had gotten an uh, economic mm -hmm. uh, base. Mm -hmm. And very often we had overlooked just the, the training, of uh, industrial training, which I think also translated into the war. Mm -hmm. When it came to evaluating the pilot, we knew the pilots, we, we knew the pilots, it was a great story to be a pilot or a soldier, uh, but the common thinking in World War II was that you really weren't contributing unless you were carrying a gun. Mm -hmm. And so when most blacks are being were uh, in, the, in the services, supply and services, that became, that became rele relegated as being menial labor. But I had my dad, Mm -hmm. uh, who was a, a diesel mechanic, and at Tuskegee he'd also he learned diesel mechanics at Tuskegee. He learned automotive mechanics. He could also uh, repair airplane engines. So he he had that Tuskegee background. So I I didn't see this me this so-called menial work since my father was part of the Red Ball Express, mm -hmm. uh, which transported the uh, munitions, fuel to the Third Army, which General George Patton was out basically out running his supply source. So we had the story of the Red Ball Express in my home. And I, I just knew that it was not the menial labor as, as it was usually portrayed by historians and Hollywood it gave you the impression that these black soldiers were just sweeping up or something. But, but their work was far different and far more crucial to the, to the nation's cause in World War II. There were about 1.23 million blacks who fought in World War II, 95% mm -hmm. of them in what we call service units. There were relatively few combat units, mm -hmm. uh, the Tuskegee Airmen, of course, the uh, 761st Tank Battalion, the Triple Nickel Paratroopers, the 24th Infantry, uh, the 369th. Mm -hmm. But uh, most of the African Americans that you describe in your book were in service units. These service units were, were construction mm -hmm. and quartermaster and supply, all of which were necessary to make a military operation yeah. work. But we didn't get a lot of medals, mm -hmm. right. and we didn't get a lot of recognition. And even when they did a movie about the Red Ball Express, the Red Ball Express was white. <laughs> Jeffrey uh, Hunter, I think, was the, the star. The Sidney Poitier is in the movie. You yeah. see a few black yeah. soldiers in the movie, but you don't realize the majority of the, of the drivers were black soldiers. The one thing I found, Dr. Brown, right from the start was uh, from Pearl Harbor, where we uh, had the story of, of, of Dory Miller, the, uh, the mess man. Uh, aboard a Navy ship who, who helped try to save his captain and then grab one of the guns aboard and, and knock down four or five uh, planes, I thought I might have a problem because, well, if you, the typical story of World War II, you have Dory Miller and then you have to fast forward to, you know, June of 43 when the Tuskegee Airmen mm -hmm. start up in North Africa. I'm wondering what happened in 42. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 the real uh, secret war, the forgotten war, takes place in 42 because right from the start in January and February of 42, black soldiers were being signed to places like Alaska where they helped to build the Alaska um, pipeline. Not the, the highway, pipeline, the, the highway, highway, right? Highway. I, we start to think of that later. Uh, They're being assigned to Australia and I didn't understand that until I found that, well, after Pearl Harbor, the, the Allies wanted to protect Australia. So they began to send service units to Australia to begin then to be to stationed on New Guinea 
and to New Caledonia, which really was the basis to help in the start of the, of the Battle of the Coral Sea, Guadalcanal, uh, Midway. There was a strategy that uh, MacArthur developed called uh, island hopping. Well, before, long before uh, the Marines were to get to Iwo Jima and to Guam, basically black service units, black and white, I don't want to forget the white soldiers the way the black soldiers have been forgotten, but they're being stationed on New Guinea, New Caledonia, the Solomon Island, Islands, the Gilbert Islands, the Christmas Islands, and they're going there first. Very often the black soldiers were first to arrive on these islands, and they're going into the jungle, they're, they're hacking the jungle out, they're creating airfields, they're going to the shorelines, they're creating docks so that more ships, ships can come and, and to really to establish air bases. It wasn't just the, uh, the naval uh, aircraft carriers that were carrying the, uh, the, the planes to the Pacific, they had the bases on the islands. So in other words, this island hopping would not have occurred without the work, the construction battalions. Also in Burma, uh, the Burma Road, we mentioned the Alaska Highway, the Burma Road, which was several hundred miles uh, going from India into China, black soldiers were two-thirds mm -hmm. of that yeah. workforce. In Iran, the Persian Gulf of World War II, over 90 percent of the construction workers, the, the, the truck drivers, were, were black soldiers who were bringing the, uh, supplying the Soviet Union. They were taking trucks and plane parts through Iran to the Soviet Union so that the Russians could battle the, um, uh, the, the Germans on the Eastern Front. So that's, that's really what's taking place in 42. It's a really uh, about 100,000 black soldiers who were distributed in, in uh, Africa, Asia, uh, North America, Iceland, uh, the the, the uh, Caribbean area. They're helping to build uh, many of the airfields there. It's 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 a tremendous story and basically was lost, really lost until 60 years later. Many of these veterans have gone, have passed without anyone ever celebrating their story. And that that was basically beyond the story of my mother and father when I began to see that there literally were 1.2 million stories of African Americans in the, in the war. And it was just sad to me that my dad passed away, not that he was looking for any acclaim, but so many of our parents mm -hmm. and, and uncles and grandfathers just this, this, is, this may be the last major anniversary, the 2005, mm -hmm. the 60th anniversary of the war, to really just to say mm -hmm. thank you to these mm -hmm. folks. Of course, uh, in your book, you describe the pride of blacks who were fighting in the war. And during that time, under the leadership of the black press, we had the double V campaign, uh, V for victory abroad, V for victory at home. And many times I'm asked, well, why would you go into a risky activity like mm -hmm. uh, Air Force fighter planes uh, when this country was discriminating against you? And my answer clearly, and I think of every black soldier, was that this is our country. Many of us have been here longer than anyone else, and we want to protect our country. And by protecting it and doing it well, the whites who were discriminating against us would realize that, and some of that yoke of oppression would come off. And indeed, in 1948, Harry Truman signed mm -hmm. Executive Order 9981, eliminating discrimination in the armed forces. Mm -hmm. That was the first breach in terms of breaking discrimination. That and Jackie Robinson mm -hmm. led to the Brown case decision of 54, which desegregated schools. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, we accomplished our purpose. But the hurt that many of us went through, not only the personal indignities, mm -hmm. but the fact that we weren't recognized, the fact that we went through such tremendous stress, the, the racism that we experienced. And in your book, mm -hmm. you have a lot of letters from various soldiers talking about those racist well, experiences. This was really the, the brilliance of Lawrence Reddick, who was director of the Schomburg Center in World War II. He knew right from the start that blacks weren't getting uh, their recognition. In fact, it was Reddick who, who really got the name of Dory Miller. From December mm. 7th until late February, nobody knew. It was just, he, was, he was just described as a Negro mess boy who had mm. done some heroic, some unspecified heroic on December 7th. And Reddick had the foresight. Uh, he contacted the Naval Department and said, look, well, we just would like his name so that we could recognize him. So it's not until March of 42, but it was because of that librarian Reddick that Dory Miller's uh, uh, name emerged. At the same time, Reddick decided to have a campaign for war letters. He really he put advertisements in black newspapers, Chicago Defender, all around the country, soliciting those letters. And even after the war, he, he had correspondence with, with uh, many of the blacks who had uh, received medals during the war. His hope, his dream really was to have these things uh, 
uh, published. He never got around to doing it. Uh, maybe there was no uh, interest uh, in that, that happens, as we know, in, when it came, comes to African American history. But it's because of those letters uh, that really helped to put the, the, the face of the soldiers, their experience, into. Uh, I'll give you a typical example uh, um, a woman writing about a black woman stationed with the USO. Uh, talking about elephants coming through her uh, her tent area, or that they're cobras and they're just the strange little bugs, which just these personal touches. It's not these aren't all just letters about shoot 'em up or I shot this person or that. Some of them are just I love you, writing their sentiments home, or they've got a letter uh, to an old girlfriend that they'd like to keep, or they're or, or different different uh, just just different relationships that the letters show. But they in in effect too they give you an idea of just really what people were experiencing at the moment. It's, it is sometimes, you know, it's great that you have, you have your memory, but some of, even my, I don't have the memory that I used to have, so it's, it's great to see these letters uh, finally coming to light. And it's not all the letters, by the way, there, there are about a thousand of them at the Schomburg Center. See, the black press in particular really told the story of World War II to the black community. Mm -hmm. They identified our heroes and sheroes. <clears throat> they talked about the efforts of the Tuskegee Airmen, the 369th, the uh, Red Ball Express. Mm -hmm. they, they did that. Uh, one thing that is, is seared in my memory is when we came back from overseas on the troop ship and we came down the gangplank, they were mostly white soldiers, but there were a lot of black soldiers, Tus Tuskegee Airmen. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a soldier at the bottom of the gang like holding up a sign that said, white troops this way, colored troops that way. Over with the white troops, there were maybe 50 mm -hmm. reporters interviewing them. With the black troops, there was Ted Post in the Post and somebody from the Amsterdam mm -hmm. News uh, and the Af Afro-American. Uh, we were really not recognized for what we had done, even though we had been heroic. Some we were German heroic in whatever we did. Uh, the uh, barrage balloons over uh, D-Day mm -hmm. were manned by black troops Absolutely. who didn't even get the credit in Steven Spielberg's Saving Private Ryan. So there's a lot to be done in your book mm -hmm. entitled uh, Black Soldiers. The Unhung Sung Heroes of World War II, it, it really tells that story. Thank that you, we were a major contributor to the success of the war effort. And also, we, as any soldiers, had experiences that we wanted to convey mm -hmm. to our relatives, to our friends, and, and the struggle. Mm -hmm. Many of these letters talk about the segregation, which unfortunately we did have to accept. But at the same time, we didn't have to like it. Mm -hmm. you know, one of the things I found very interesting in the book, you talked about the blacks in the military in sports. In practically every one of the sports, football, baseball, boxing, track and field, uh, when they had competitions, the uh, black soldiers mm -hmm. would end up winning. Yeah. Uh, Jackie Robinson was uh, one of those soldiers. <laughs> uh, uh, Ulysses Peacock, the great runner, was one of those soldiers. Uh, Don Boxfield, the great basketball player, was one of those. And Roscoe Lee Brown. Roscoe Lee Brown, my namesake, <laughs> who was a, a, uh, yes. a track star. Right, right. So that uh, it's that's interesting. Now, why do you think the whites did accept blacks because they were playing on integrated teams many times? Why do you think they accepted them? They didn't all accept them. But I guess it was a lot of it happened just starting with the pickup games, that mm -hmm. there might be a group of black soldiers and they'll play against a group of white soldiers. Whenever it was organized activity, they still were being segregated. Mm -hmm. It's actually because in Australia in 1942, April 1942, a black uh, engineering unit that was stationed in Australia, uh, apparently they were having trouble getting games with the white soldiers, but the Australians invited them into their league. Mm -hmm. And what happened was this, this one group of black soldiers won the Macar was called the MacArthur Cup. They won, the, I think it was the best of five series. But you know, before they were able to receive the MacArthur Cup, they were shipped out to New Guinea. So they actually never got a chance mm -hmm. to, um, to, to, to get that reward. But throughout the war, you see the cases, and, and I, I find it interesting sociologically in that it was, it's really the confident, there was the confident white athlete, the confident white soldier who welcomed the competition with the black mm -hmm. soldiers. It was those who perhaps had a little fear that they might be beaten that uh, they didn't want the black soldiers to play. But I think if, after seeing through the war four years of, of a lot of this uh, 
interracial competition, it's, it's affecting Major League Baseball. Because at the same time, you've got a, uh, there was an effort within the country, many of the black newspapers, black sports writers, who were, who were battling for integration. They were saying, you know, if you can put us uh, in the, uh, the, put us in the box score, if we're, we're fighting for the country, why can't we also be in the box score? So that by October 1945, you do see Jackie mm -hmm. Robinson signed by uh, Branch Rickey. Mm -hmm. Next year, 46, I think it's the Cleveland Browns and the Los Angeles Rams, uh, four uh, black NFL players. Mm -hmm. A few years later, the NBA. But it really, the, the, the nation, even the, the white and black players began to, to see each other in athletic competition first during the war. Now in 2005, how do you think the nation is, has responded and is responding to the black contributions in the military in defense of our country, going from the Revolutionary War to the Civil War to the Spanish-American War to World War, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Persian Gulf. How, how do you think the white community relates to blacks in the military? Well, I, th I think overall there's still an ignorance <clears throat> excuse me, about uh, what black soldiers have done for the country since the Revolutionary War, Civil War, all the way through the war. Um, the one thing I, I want to mention here, too, is that within this book, Fighting for America, it's not just a, a saber-rattling type of book, which, which is, sort of leads me to what present day is. Um, it's, a, it's a book about how people fight for America, uh, whether it be as pilots or as, as construction workers, but also as protesters. As far as I'm concerned, Mary McLeod Bethune was, very, was fighting for America as much as Douglas MacArthur ever was. I bring that to 2005, where there's, a, there's that danger of... Um, of placing everyone, it's, a, it's the patriotism kind of effect there, that if, that if you're not a soldier, it's, they, they, we're somehow trying, it seems, sometimes not too subtly, to remove the protester from, from the patriot cause. Mm -hmm. um, to that I say, yes, uh, we, I mean, we've got uh, many of our leaders, certainly the Secretary of State and the former Secretary of State, uh, I think there's an overall awareness um, uh, of, of the black soldier, and certainly within the military itself, it, even though they, they had a tradition of uh, discrimination, they became very much a, a democratic institution by the, the 60s and the 70s. I guess my, my f sort of fear and my answer to your question is that we don't overlook those who, who aren't saber rattlers, but, but are patriots. Who do who, who who may very well be against mm -hmm. the war in Iraq, but love their country just as much as 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 as, as, as the generals who uh, got us involved in this thing. Yeah, Bayard Rustin in the Civil Rights Movement was a conscientious objector. Absolutely. Uh, Paul Robeson was uh, one who supported the war, but then later he said, mm -hmm. "We need to reach out to other people," and for that he was uh, besmirched. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the pride that blacks have in their service for America. How did you feel that? How did that come through in the book? Well, I, up and down the line, uh, and again, it, it's sort of a, a disconnect from the experience of discrimination. My dad used to joke that my mother enlisted, but he was drafted, mm -hmm. right? But at the same time, he do he ha he was aware that he had every mu everything at, at stake. That his family had helped within the slave, uh, the first the the, the first. Uh, uh, it, it's not it's that, um, that America doesn't understand what soldiers did. They don't understand what enslaved Americans did for mm -hmm. two or three hundred years. Mm -hmm. But through, my father had that kind of pride. I found through most of the black soldiers, even though some of them sign on as, as, as you, you would think you were talking to MacArthur himself, there was, there was, there was a connection between the black soldiers and their country, just mm -hmm. the, up and down the line. It was, ju it was just that they had that that double V to deal with, that victory against the Nazis abroad and the victory against the Nazi wannabes here at home. They, and it, it, it never really threw off their sense of patriotism. That's what I found most remarkable, that the, 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 the men and women still had that patriotism because in the conscious mind, when I started this, when I started really talking to my father just a few years before he passed about his war experience, I often wondered, I, because I came up through the 60s, what is so patriotic about this country? In fact, one of the things that helped to shape this book, Dr. Brown, was, was 911. I came out of the subway when the second plane uh, hit the tower. I was at Chambers Street, and I experienced that just from sort of, not in the dangerous position that the people who lost their lives, but I, I saw what took place. And my son, uh, a day or two later, six years old at the time, asked for an American flag. 
And that kind of scared me because I came up through a time, well, we didn't really want to be careful signing a blank check mm -hmm. to what our policy was. But I, ha I did have the sense that through the end, through, through watching what African Americans have done in the early wars, through World War II mm -hmm. and now in Iraq, was that we do, it, that no one has more of a stake in this nation and how it develops and how it uh, treats its citizens and how, it is, how it's part of the global community. No one has a, has, has a greater stake than, than African Americans. And you, uh, Christopher Moore, are a very lucky guy. You work at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. You understand the struggles. You understand our victories. Absolutely. And you've done an excellent job of presenting this in your book. Uh, Black Soldiers, the Fighting for America, is the, is the, it's got two or, two or three titles up there. The first title is actually Fighting for America, but that subtitle is Black Soldiers, the Unsung Heroes of and World War II. And we all fought for America, and I'm so pleased that you did this book published by Ballantine Books, and I hope that a lot of folks will read this and will maybe come to Schomburg for some of the presentations. Absolutely. We, we have great presentations apart from the war itself. Please come to the Schomburg Okay, Center. thanks to uh, Christopher Moore for being with us on today's African-American Legends.